Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. The tell-all book, Fire and Fury, Inside the Trump White House by Michael Wolff has become an instant bestseller. The original print run of 150,000 copies sold out almost immediately, and the next print run will be 1.4 million, according to a recent report. For those who haven't heard, the book provides all kinds of intimate details about the inner workings, or failures to work, of the Trump uh, administration and his staff. But what does the book tell us uh, that we don't on some level already know? Joining me to discuss this aspect of the book is Doug Henwood. Doug is the editor of the Left Business Observer, the host of the radio program Behind the News, and author of My Turn, Hillary Clinton Targets the Presidency. Thanks for joining me today, Doug. Oh, thanks for having me. So first of all, what would you say can we learn from Fire and Fury that we didn't already know in some level? Well, I think there's a value uh, to having confirmed things we thought we knew. And there's an awful lot of rumor that floats around or, you know, supposition or extrapolations. Uh, and, uh, you know, that I, as I was reading the book, uh, every page I thought, well, you know, I sort of knew this, but it's actually worse than I thought. Uh, the president's profound ignorance, uh, psychological immaturity, uh, the vo volatility, uh, and then uh, the infighting among his aides, the incoherence of everything that goes on around him. Uh, it's just, it's, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, and, you know, I thought I was hard to shock, but uh, there are pages where I'd say, oh my God, I can't really believe what I just read. Um, the, uh, you know, there, there's, but, you know, the big story, I guess, is that behind all that chaos, Trump does have some people, and this Wolf doesn't really go into this, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, behind all the chaos, Trump does have people like Scott Pruitt at the EPA, who are really doing what Bannon wanted to do, dismantle the administrative state uh, and deregulating everything. Um, so, you know, we're seeing the, the wholesale undoing of decades of environmental regulations. Uh, we're going to see you know, workplace safety regulations undone uh, and uh, it, it, a revolting and intense war on immigrants. Uh, all this is going on while, you know, all this uh, nonsense is going on around the Oval Office. So, you know, on one hand, you see this picture of absolute paralysis and dysfunction. Uh, but on the other hand, under the surface, which is something that Wolf unfortunately doesn't go into, you do have uh, a very aggressive agenda. Uh, and one of the things that struck me as I was reading this is that there's such a vacuum at the top that uh, 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 Trump kind of outsources policy. Uh, and he didn't come into office as some sort of hardcore right winger with a right wing agenda. Uh, but that's the kind of administration he's running. I don't think anybody expected he was going to uh, be uh, be so friendly with the Koch brothers' agenda, but he clearly is that that. Uh, and there's there's some passages where, like for example, uh, Trump uh, he talks about how Trump, where where Wolf talks about how Trump uh, came to sign over fiscal policy and the Obamacare repeal to Paul Ryan. Uh, and Paul Ryan hardly, in any sense, a legislative genius or a policy genius, but uh, Trump didn't know how to handle Congress, doesn't have the first idea how anything works. So he had a meeting with uh, Paul Ryan one afternoon. Ryan impressed him somehow, and Trump said, okay, you take care of that. So it was a way, and the way Wolf explains this is like, this was something that Trump didn't have to think about anymore. Ryan was going to handle everything. So that's how we're going to get, you know, tax policy by Ryan, the Obamacare repeal, which turned out to be a failure, but only at least you know, in that dramatic moment, they're chipping away at it gradually. But that's, you know, that's how Ryan came to be such a, a, a driver of the domestic agenda. So it's that vacuum. Uh, the intellectual policy vacuum that uh, the right wing, which has you know a pre uh, op a, a prefabricated off the shelf agenda, uh, they've they've moved in very successfully uh, while well, Trump is, is off golfing. That's one of the things I was wondering about. Is that um, I mean, he, the, uh, Wolf at one point describes uh, Trump as being a vehicle of sorts uh, for other people. Uh, there's one quote. Uh, let me just read it. He says, uh, "Quote," and re referring to Roger Ailes. Uh, that's way in the beginning, I think, in the in the introduction. Ailes had been observing politicians for decades. In his long career, he had witnessed uh, just about every type and style of oddity and confection and craveness and mania. Operatives like himself, and now like Bannon, worked with all kinds. Kinds. It was their ultimate symb uh, symbiotic and codependent relationship. Um, politicians were front men in a complex organizational effort. Operatives knew the game, and so did most candidates and office holders. 
but Ailes was pretty sure Trump did not. Trump was undisciplined. He had no capacity for any game plan. He could not be part of any organization, nor was he likely to subscribe to any program or principle. In Ailes' view, he was a rebel without a cause. He was simply Donald, as though nothing more needed to be said. Um, so if Trump was a vehicle, why have such an incompetent one at that? I don't think anybody intended to have Trump be the vehicle. Uh, he was very unpopular with the party's money people, the professional politicians. Uh, he was just seen as a bomb thrower. That's that, uh, and to uh, the professionals, that's the last thing you want in office is a bomb thrower. Uh, but that's what won him the Republican nomination. That's eventually what won him uh, um, the presidency. Uh, it's not. I don't think um, any ruling elites. There are very few members of the ruling elite who, who supported Trump in any sense. They've come around now to some degree, uh, but you know, all he had to do is dangle tax cuts and deregulation in front of Wall Street and the Fortune 500, and they become you know loyal puppies uh, uh, to him. But you know, people, any people, anybody in Washington with any kind of serious notion of governance or policy, uh, I think, is still appalled by the guy. Um, I don't, he's not really a vehicle of for much of anything except. By default, I mean this vacuum that he represents uh, was was uh, you know occupied then by uh, uh, reactionary politicians like Paul Ryan and puppets of the Koch brothers. You got Koch brothers people all over the administration now, uh, and uh, they're doing what they wanted to do, which is you know discard all environmental regulation, all labor regulation, frack and drill uh, with abandon. I mean that's pretty much their agenda, and have not pay no taxes. I mean that's. Uh, the Koch brothers' agenda, and that is pretty much the agenda of uh, the people who are running Trump, because he has no idea what he's doing. Well, it seems like they've settled on some kind of agenda, because I mean now, uh, but in the beginning that wasn't really the case, and that's what a large part of the book seems to be also about the infighting that was going on, particularly between Steve Bannon, um, Reigns Priebus, and then what uh, Wolf calls Jarvanka, which is you know the the combination of Jared Kushner and uh, his wife Ivanka Trump. Um, and that each one of these represent a, diff a different faction in this political, basically in the right of the US. Um, but uh, now that uh, Bannon and Priebus have left, um, could it be that they've, uh, uh, they've come together in some way? I mean, let me just read another quote, which, uh, well, there's one part which certainly illustrates uh, also, of course, what you were saying earlier about um, uh, the ruling class or the ruling elites coming together behind Trump to some extent. Um, let me just read this part where uh, he says, uh, referring to Rupert Murdoch of, of, you know, the owner of Fox News, etc. Murdoch was hardly the only billionaire who had been dismissive of Trump. In the years before the election, Carl Icahn, whose friendship Trump often cited and who Trump had suggested he'd appoint to high office, openly ridicu ridiculed his fellow billionaire. Few people who knew Trump had illusions about him. That was almost his appeal. He was what he was, twinkle in his eye, larceny in his soul. <laughs> and eventually they come around. Um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting is how they also come around that is Trump himself seems to become more oriented toward a particular um, sector, so to speak, of the uh, elites, uh, where there was one, uh, you know, at first he had this meeting, there was an anecdote, it's too long, I won't read it now, but uh, we had this meeting with Silicon Valley executives uh, and uh, then afterwards spoke to uh, Murdoch, who said, you know, that's when he referred to him as an idiot <laughs> because he was enamored by the Silicon Valley executives. But later on, then he had this, uh, um, this council where uh, and where uh, the council says most people, uh, this is uh, again a quoting uh, from the Wolf's book, but most of the people on the council, other than Elon Musk, the investor, were not from media or tech companies with their liberal bent from old line when America was great enterprises. They were Mary Barra, CEO of Ger uh, General Motors, Ginny Rometty of IBM, Jack Welsh, former CEO of General Electric. Jim McMurney, uh, the former CEO of Boeing, Indra Nooyi of PepsiCo. If the new right had elected Trump, it was the older Fortune 100 uh, executives who most pleased him. How, how real would you say are these divisions, uh, uh, both within the White House and uh, and within the larger economy? I mean, does, is it, would you agree with that, that, that this is the, there seem to be settling on this kind of older uh, sector of, of corporate America? Well, first, you know, that, that Murdoch anecdote is interesting because Trump, uh, having just met with uh, the Silicon Valley people, uh, thought that he was going to offer relief to Silicon Valley uh, because he thought they were suffering under Obama. And Murdoch told him, you know, Silicon Valley loved Obama. He had them in their, uh, they had him in uh, their pockets. Uh, and uh, Trump had no idea of that. I mean, the guy just really knew nothing about what the Obama administration did or stood for, or what his relations to the, you know, this um, 
crucial segment of American business were. Uh, but what, what struck me, even going back into the campaign, uh, that uh, Trump is so backward looking for an American politician. American politics is usually all about all these you know, hopes and dreams for the future. I remember Richard Nixon, his, I think his acceptance speech in 1968 talked about the lift of a driving dream. It was all, uh, and you know, Bill Clinton, the bridge to the 21st century. It was all about uh, endless possibilities ahead of us. And Trump ran on such an intensely, first of all, bitter, the emotional uh, content of his campaign was just so bitter and angry, which is kind of unusual in a lot of American presidential politics, but also very oriented towards these old industries, you know, primary and secondary sector industries and not the industries of the future, like, you know, Silicon Valley, artis artificial intelligence, uh, you know, even, you know, he, he's obviously uh, contemptuous of anything like clean energy. Uh, I think, you know, windmills are for pansies uh, in, in Trump world. Uh, and he's all about drilling. You know, and you know, I think a lot of uh, and coal, I mean, coal is dying on its own. It's not like there's no war on coal. Coal is a very dirty uh, and uh, inefficient uh, a form of energy. Uh, and it's just becoming uneconomical uh, in, in the real world without any kind of assistance from uh, uh, you know, tree-hugging liberals. Uh, but Trump doesn't really seem to understand that. He, he wants to go back to uh, oil and coal. He's deeply, uh, uh, you know, he's in love with carbon, uh, but also steel mills and all these symbols of like mid 20th century <coughs> American industrial power. Uh, and that was an appeal to uh, certainly the uh, uh, a lot of the voters in, in the American heartland who have been uh, very damaged by the uh, the decay of that old industrial power. But you know, it's not uh, a prescription for the future. Uh, you know, pe people like Trump are contemptuous of all this talk of a green new deal, of 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 having an economic stimulus, uh, job creation programs based around new forms of energy uh, and other you know clean ways of of doing business. He's not the least bit interested in that sort of thing. It's all about going back to the industries of yesterday, making America, <clears throat> making America great again, which is, you know, that, those kinds of Fortune 100 companies, uh, you know, GM, U.S. Steel, those sorts of things you'd think of as the old corporate elite of the 1950s and 1960s. It's strange uh, to uh, see that kind of um, appeal uh, to yesteryear uh, in American politics. And there are many things that have made me think that, you know, this country has really seen its best days uh, and that it's slowly rotting. But the, 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 the Trump uh, administration, the election of Trump and then his actual attempts at governing this country convinced me that, you know, the, the, uh, the rot has accelerated. There's just no optimism, no orientation towards the future, no thought of, of how to make things better. It's all this uh, bitter, exclusionary, uh, reactionary in the truest sense uh, approach to, to the political economy. This concludes part one of our discussion with Doug Henwood about the book Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House by Michael Wolf. Join us for part two uh, of our discussion.